we have a very special guest today, uh, Glenn Ford, uh, who has been working on the Korean Peninsula for a very long time and expert uh, on uh, uh, the northern part uh, of the uh, peninsula. Uh, so um, I will just uh, say a few words uh, to Glenn, but first of all, my sincere welcome uh, that you are here. Um, our event will be discussing uh, the topic about talking and listening uh, to North Korea. And uh, the reason for that is that for, uh, for decades, uh, there have been uh, various attempts to bring the peace and denuclearization to the Korean Peninsula, but these attempts uh, um, had its ups and downs, and uh, Glenn uh, uh, has followed many of these attempts in, in person. He is also the one who has been writing and uh, publishing about uh, uh, North Korea. Uh, his like, his book, uh, Talking to North Korea, uh, came out in 2018. If I may say, he's probably one of the people who probably visited uh, the DPRK uh, most times. I think it's short of 50, you can tell us more about that. So first of all, welcome. Uh, I'll give you probably about 20 minutes to tell us something about your experience uh, and then we will have discussion. So without much further ado, Glenn, please. Okay, thank you very much. Can I say I'm delighted to, to be here in Berlin. Uh, Slightly disappointed that uh, you're all online, or the vast majority of you are online rather than in person, but nevertheless, uh, it is an opportunity. Uh, as Teresa said, uh, I was a member of the European Parliament from uh, 1984 to 2009, uh, but got interested in, 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 in North Korea, uh, principally because uh, I had a visit from the, uh, the North Korean ambassador ambassador uh, to, uh, to UNESCO in Paris in 1997, who came to see me because of the, uh, 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 of the problems of, uh, 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 of the food crisis in the North. And uh, the result of that was that I actually uh, went with two colleagues uh, on an unofficial delegation to, to, to North Korea. And uh, that started a process uh, we then, the European Parliament then sent uh, some official delegations, ad hoc delegations to North Korea. And by 2004, as Theresa mentioned, uh, I proposed with, uh, that we should establish a standing delegation with the Korean Peninsula. So we, the European Parliament still has a, a standing delegation that deals with uh, relations between uh, the, the European Parliament and North Korea and South Korea. Um, I left the parliament, well, I left, uh, the, the people, the good people of the southwest of England decided they preferred somebody else. Uh, don't be too, too coy about it, I lost the election, um, uh, but I continued my interest in North Korea. And in 2010, the, I was approached by uh, the International Department of the Korean Workers' Party to actually set up a political dialogue. Uh, because I was a politician, uh, I tended to deal with the party when I was in North Korea, rather than with the uh, rather than with the uh, the ministries. So, in that sense, it's slightly unusual. Most of the kind of track two dialogues, track one point five dialogues, actually are between, uh, if if you want, NGOs and uh, sections within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In our case, we had a, our dialogue was with the International De Department of the Party. And, of course, in North Korea, uh, so the party is closer to the decision-making process than the ministries. So that, that gave us access. They asked me in 2010 uh, to set up a dialogue, uh, which I did, um, with a, a number of former uh, politicians from, from, from Germany, from Sweden, from France, from, from the United Kingdom, uh, and that dialogue's been ongoing. Uh, I haven't been to uh, North Korea since 2018. That was my last visit, although uh, the North Korean embassy in London has made it clear that they would like us to take the delegation back again as soon as things are possible. I think it's unlikely that that's going to be this year, but hopefully early next year we can continue that, we can continue that dialogue. So that will that will continue. 
we we've been talking to uh, uh, I mean the head of the international part of the party. Uh, the last one we saw was Riso Young. He's he's since been replaced, uh, but he was a member of the executive committee of the Politburo. So um, that's a pretty pretty senior level. Uh, fairly typically, we would go over to uh, to Pyongyang, and we'd spend uh, a, a four or five hours with him, uh, meet people from the United Front Department. Because, of course, um, North South relations are not foreign affairs; they're domestic affairs in in, in North Korea, as it as is true in the South. So that's a, a a dimension that some people at least don't necessarily appreciate. Uh, we we would then visit some of the monuments. If I see the Juche Tower once more, I'm going to scream, but fine. Uh, we tend to have new people, so you tend to have to repeat the uh, the, uh, the the tourist the tourist bit, and then we will conclude with a long dinner with uh, with that with our host. Uh, so we would spend some fairly serious time with with, with fairly senior people. Entitled to my book, uh, talking to North Korea. Um, and someone pointed out to me that not only should we talk to them, we should also listen, which is I entitled the, the talk listening to North Korea. What you, from listening to North Korea, what, what are the main takeaways that I uh, actually have? Well, I mean, from, from what I'm told, uh, there, there are a series of misapprehensions outside of North Korea about what the North Koreans actually want and, and desire. Um, firstly, I'd make the point about unification. Uh, the North Koreans we talk to make it very clear that they have no interest in early unification. Why? They're very well aware that the economy in North Korea is 40, 50 times smaller than in South Korea. Early unification can only be assimilation. Uh, what they want, they blame the United States for its hostile policy, but the argument they have is if the United States would get off their backs. North Korea, uh, North Koreans are as enterprising, as dynamic, as uh, hardworking as uh, uh, as their brothers in the South. They could grow their economy at 10, 15 percent a year for 10, 15, 20 years. Then you can talk unification because the two will at least be in the same league, if not equivalent in terms of the economy. So there's the, the myth of unification. Secondly, in terms of the, uh, the development of a, a nuclear deterrent, this is a sign, they don't put it this way, it's my translation, but this is a sign of weakness rather than strength. The reality is that South Korea spends five times more on its military than North Korea does. South Korea's budget may be only 2 or 3% of the GDP, but the GDP is that much larger. 25% is not very much, which is not very much, uh, which is what the North Koreans spend. Uh, so the, in terms of the arms race, they've been outlapped completely. If you look at the spending of uh, Japan, the United States, and South Korea together, they outspend North Korea in terms of military, uh, uh, military expenditure by a factor of 50. So the nuclear deterrent is the only way to, to deal with that. It also serves a second purpose. The two big uh, blockages in the North Korean economy are energy, which I'll come back to, and manpower. I mean, it literally is manpower because you've got a million people in the army on a 10-year on cons uh, conscription. Uh, if you could just decrease that to nine years, that's 100,000 new workers into the system. So you, you, so it's weakness, not not strength. Um, economic reform. There's some people impose on North Korea their image of what economic reform is. North North Korea, from their perspective, is not a failed state. This is not Central and Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Empire. This is this this is a state that's still there. They don't want. They're not interested in privatization and the rest. Their image of reform is much more to learn from China, from Vietnam, from, from South Korea and Japan. It's uh, their image of, if you want, the economy is closer to the Zaibatsu and the Chobol. And you're seeing that beginning to emerge. 
what they're more nervous about is what I call the kiosk capitalists, uh, the people opening up the stores on the streets and the rest. Half of them fail, uh, but probably out of the other half, nine out of ten uh, survive, uh, but one or two take off. And there's always a concern that they're, they're not under control. They much prefer, if you want, the, the new enterprises that are encouraging under the umbrella of the ministries, the military and, uh, and, and sections of the party. So, it's, uh, it, so, so when we see recently that there's been a kind of crackdown on what, what I call the roaming and uh, masterless uh, uh, capitalist enterprises, that's not necessarily going against reform per se. That's actually selecting the kind of economic reform and economic modernization that, that, that they actually want to see. In terms of a settlement on the peninsula, uh, I think it's it's possible. I'm not sure it's probable, but it's certainly possible. Uh, but what is clear, and to be fair, I think uh, President Biden has recognized that it will be a process, not performance. It, it's, it will be an event that takes place over two or three days uh, with 100,000 press watching it or whatever. Uh, it's going to be a process that's going to have to be mapped out with way stations on the way, but it will probably take a decade. So uh, it, 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 trust has got to be built, and there isn't any trust on both sides for good reason. Uh, and so on that basis, you will, you, you will see that process unroll. Now, if it's going to take a decade, that also has messages for, the pol for politicians back in both in, in, in South Korea and the United States. Because that means in both countries, it's not only the next president, but the one after Who's going, to have to, who's going to have to oversee this process. And, and, and so it needs to be a bipartisan approach if you're, if you're, if you're going to be successful. Um, we also need to deal with uh, what's the settlement going to look like. It seems to me that any settlement is, in the end, is going to be uh, a, a multilateral. Uh, of course, the core, the foundation of any settlement on the peninsula has got to be between, if you want, Pyongyang and Washington. I mean, there is no, there is no solution unless those, those two are actually on, on board. But for different reasons, uh, there's a multi, there will be a multilateral element to this that will clearly bring in uh, South Korea, it will, bring in, uh, it will bring in China, possibly Japan, Russia, maybe even the European Union. Uh, the North Koreans take the position very clearly that you know, a settlement is not going to be a piece of paper signed by the current U.S. president. They want something that's much more robust. They went through the experience of the agreed framework back in 1994, when a U.S. president, Clinton, actually made a promise to deliver two light water reactors by 2002. Well, in 2002-03, uh, uh, George Bush, the elder, abandoned that it tore it up. That was it finished. Uh, they don't want to be in that situation, and they're paying close attention to the joint comprehensive plan of action with Iran, because interestingly, uh, when Donald Trump, when President Trump said that he, he he wanted to abrogate, he wanted to tear up that agreement. Actually, the other parties to that agreement, China, Russia, as you might expect, but also uh, uh, Germany. France, the, the United Kingdom said, hang on, it's the Iranians are doing what's what was promised. So it had a, a robustness, uh, a resilience that if you want the agreed framework didn't have. And so the North Koreans are paying very close attention to President Biden's attempt to resurrect uh, that agreement. Uh, of course, there may be some small tweaks, but if it's fundamentally renegotiated, that's going to be read in Pyongyang as uh, the fact that they will not, they cannot trust a future American administration to necessarily abide by uh, a, a deal that's done under under this administration. Uh, so you will, you will have security guarantees that are probably going to be very similar to the JPCOA, uh, which will be UN Security Council plus. The plus will be different. The plus will be South Korea, uh, maybe Japan, but that's going to be the, the basis of the deal. 
On the American side, I mean, it's very clear, like with the, with the agreed framework, had 4.5 billion uh, a commitment to buy, build two light water reactors in, in North Korea to supply the energy that was, uh, they were going to lose because of closing down their plant, their moderated reactor capable of producing weapons-grade plutonium. This time around, the North Koreans have gone much further. This is no longer a deal to stop them developing nuclear weapons. This will be a deal to get rid of their capability of producing more weapons-grade material and give up the nuclear weapons and nuclear material they have already. So that's going to be more expensive, and obviously time's moved on. So you're probably looking at needing 15 to 20 billion. Now, for political and financial reasons, President Biden is unwilling, but even if he was willing, he would be unable. Congress is never going to agree to give those kinds of sums of money to North Korea, even over a period of a decade. Uh, and that means somebody else is paying. Certainly, South Korea is going to probably be paying more than anybody else, but you're, you're likely to have the European Union. You may even have some contributions in some form, probably not in terms of hard cash, but maybe an extension of the Belt and Road Initiative from China, maybe even something on the Eastern policy from Russia, and maybe from the European Union. So there's going to be a donors, there's going to be a donors package as well. So it seems to me that's, that's where we are. Uh, before I shut up, I will talk a little bit about where are we now. Uh, we've obviously got a new administration in, in Washington. The North Koreans are paying close attention to that new administration. Uh, I used to say that I agreed with nothing that Donald Trump did, which you might expect as a member of the British Labour Party, apart from North Korea. Uh, I, I am a bit nervous at times that it's going to be the reverse with Biden. I'm going to agree with everything he did, uh, apart from North Korea, as it seems to me that the uh, we've got to a position where there are some uh, there's some uncertainty about uh, the position. Um, certainly, the North Koreans are very keen that the foundations, the low foundations of any future deal are actually based on the Singapore Declaration. Uh, uh, and the language being used by people in the White House and the State Department have gone away from that. I know there's a certain enthusiasm in Washington to use different language from that of Donald Trump, but it can be quite, it can be quite important because the North Koreans are very sensitive to the Singapore language. They're very keen on, uh, if you want, the denuclearization of the peninsula. Why is that an issue? Because they actually have, because their second, I said that the, the, the two major blockages in North Korea are manpower and energy. They still have any, they still want a civil nuclear program. If you talk about denuclearizing the peninsula, that seems to imply they can have a civil nuclear program. It's very unlikely that South Korea will intend to give up all of its, all of its nuclear power stations. When you start talking about denuclearizing North Korea, as some people have done in the new administration, then that seems to imply that they can't keep their civil nuclear program. So for them, that's, a, that's an important distinction. Peace processes are best made in the dark. Uh, so I'm also a little bit nervous about uh, President Biden wanting to involve Congress deeply in this process. Uh, it, it, Congress is... It, it, Congress will need to... to it, the signs off on things, but if they're deeply involved, it will be it, it, it will be it will be more tricky. And certainly, the North Koreans will be very nervous about Biden's enthusiasm for involving Japan. Uh, Japan is a is an important player in the region, but from a North Korean perspective, rightly or wrongly, uh, Japan was seen to be, if you want, the uh, the, the country that blocked progress in the six-party talks, because understandably, Japanese public opinion is outraged about the abductee issue, but uh, uh, that, 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 that's, that's a separate issue. If you think that the key problem is actually to, if you want to find a, uh, a settlement on the Korean Peninsula, then you, and there are good reasons to think that there may be other priorities, but if that's your priority, you, you, you have to do it and ignore some of the other sensitive issues around the agenda. Uh, again, the G7 summit 
uh, foreign ministers meeting that said that North Korea has to give up its nuclear, its chemical, its biological and its cyber weapons. Uh, uh, enlarges the agenda in a way that's not helpful for finding a solution. But I'll stop there. Uh, I'm sure Teresa will put me to the question uh, uh, on some of the things I've said and some of the things I haven't. So thank you. Yes, well, thank you very much for such a, you know, uh, tourists from, from the 1990s all the way uh, to the current situation. Maybe just to follow up on the current uh, Issues. I mean, you mentioned Singapore declara declaration, but of course, the sort of the last uh, attempt to reach a deal uh, took place in Hanoi. We we all know uh, that this was the this was the end of any discussions. And at the moment, it seems like um, that on one hand, uh, President Biden has announced that the North Korea review has been finished, but we don't know what's what's in there. Uh, his administration was also sort of publicly saying that they tried to reach out to the North Korean side, but uh, haven't got any answer. Uh, so, um, it, you know, at the moment, it doesn't look like there's much even communication between the two sides. So how, how would you, you know, how would you see this? Uh, what should I, be done? I don't think people appreciated quite how brutal Hanoi was for the North Koreans. I mean, it's partly, again, uh, of infighting inside the administration uh, of, of President Trump. Uh, the special representative and deputy secretary of state, uh, uh, Steve Began, actually made a speech at Stanford about two, three months before the Hanoi summit, in which he seemed to outline there very clearly the kind of what, what North Korea had to do the choreography of how we're going to, to do this, and it was going to be a process. Um, the North Koreans paid close attention, and they learned, they learned the dance steps. They learned what they had to do. The problem was that at the time, John Bolton was there with uh, President Trump and, and decided to persuade President Trump in a sense that he could short-circuit all of this. So instead of it was going to be a process, it was going to be a one-off deal and everything was going to be done and, and Trump would go home in, in triumph. The reality is that for a whole variety of reasons, partly around the civil nuclear program, because North Korea, like with Iran, wants to keep uranium enrichment. But low, they need low-level uranium enrichment to, to fuel their civil nuclear power stations. Now, you need controls and monitoring and the rest, but the demand that was that they had to give up all of this and, and, and the rest. So the North Koreans kind of backed away uh, from the process. Uh, the three and a half day train journey back from Hanoi to Pyongyang must have been grim, to put it mildly. And I think what people didn't, didn't appreciate was factions may be strong, but there's different tendencies in, amongst the North Korean leadership. Uh, and there were a, a group of people within the foreign ministry and the party that were actually promoting engagement and a solution. Now, after that, all those people went. Uh, I don't use the word purge, but they were all replaced. Uh, and, and so you've got a new harder line group. And people will, certainly in North Korea, people will be, even will be more wary about going down that road again because the experience was a what was a painful one uh it seemed to me that what was on offer uh, john bolton was right it wasn't everything but if you're but what do you expect if it's going to be a process of course you're not going to get everything at the beginning it was a it was certainly a very serious offer because it essentially was closing down the Yongbyon facility, which is where North Korea has its uh, gas-moderated reactor, which actually produces the weapons-grade plutonium. The very fact of that closing would at least, if nothing else, stop North Korea continuing to accumulate on a month-by-month yeah, a -month basis more weapons-grade plutonium for its nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the same time, as much as there hasn't been at the moment much uh, of uh, negotiations between the US and uh, North Korea, there hasn't been much even contact between the South Korean and 
uh, North Korean side. So how do you see how the inter-Korean relations uh, negotiations fit into it? And do you see that, you know, given the fact that President Moon will be leaving uh, next year, whether he still has any chance to, you know, move at least the inter-Korean side of things forward? Yeah, I mean, North Koreans have really been closed down for quite a, a long time. And certainly a, a combination of Hanoi, the aftermath, and, and now COVID uh, uh, has, has meant that North Korea has turned in on itself. I think there's some evidence that they're, they're beginning to open up. They're still not sure, in my view, what the position of the United States is, because they're getting slightly mixed messages from, from, from different people at different times. There's not a... I mean, I think it would be useful if President Biden came out and, and said categorically that you know, the starting point is Singapore. There's a long, long way to go. I mean, it's, it's low level, but that, at least that would give them something to, uh, that there's something they like. I mean, they sign the, 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 the Singapore Declaration. Uh, I think there's some evidence that there, that there's some exchanges going on. Uh, I'm... Uh, and, and I have no access to confidential information from, from Seoul, but uh, the indications are the fact that the South Koreans are building a big video conferencing facility seems to suggest that that's, that, that's not just about family reunions. Uh, I don't think you're going to have person-to-person -person meetings in a while, but uh, I think there's some evidence that there, that there may be some dialogue that's taking place. Uh, but... As everybody, I think, knows, I mean, it's talking to the Americans that's going to be what counts, but uh, that, that's going to take a while. The other problem they have, uh, frankly, uh, they pay close attention to, to political developments. And, well, firstly, they're well aware of that there's a presidential election in, in, in South Korea next year. Uh, uh, they're also well aware of the results of the mayoral elections in Busan and, more importantly, in Seoul. Uh, they, they've had this problem before. Uh, they, they had the summit with uh, the President No, uh, and, and then he was replaced by President Lee Moon Bak. Uh, and all that was agreed then disappeared, which is why I made the point earlier about it needs to be a bipartisan approach. Um, actually, I was quite intrigued. I, I read, and I haven't seen the full details, that the leader of the opposition in the National Assembly has called for the ab abolition of the Ministry of Unification. I suspect for very different reasons that might be quite an important signal for the North Koreans. They see, they see early unification as you know, assimilation. So uh, to, to actually publicly acknowledge that might be a good thing. Right, right. So, yeah, despite what we usually expect that and the North Korean side would prefer the progressive side in South Korea. If this this happens, they might uh, switch uh, switch their views. Uh, I mean, the other thing the North Koreans are doing, of course, is they want to push the uh, the South Koreans to, to to break away at least a little from 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 the United States. Uh, I mean, that's a decision that has to be made in in Seoul. But it it, it seems to me that. Uh, those few people uh, who still take the view in Washington that the uh, the answer to the North Korean problem is maximum pressure, uh, I, 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 I think can, to a limited degree, can be overridden. I mean, the reality is that anything that could be could have been done to North Korea in terms of sanctions has been done to the North Koreans by themselves. They have closed the last 12 months more. 15 months, the economy has been completely closed to the outside. I mean, there is, there is nothing I can conceive of that, that will put more pressure on the North Koreans than they put on themselves when they've taken the option of, if you want, prioritizing zero COVID over, over the economy. I mean, it's a choice lots of countries have had to make, and, and North Korea is no different. Uh, you know, yeah, it, Austra China, Australia, New Zealand have all taken the same uh, same kind of approach, but it's been a, a, at a substantial cost, and at some point that's got to got to end. I mean, I don't know whether there are any cases in North Korea of, of COVID. I suspect they're very few, partly because they locked down so early, and partly because of the nature of the society. The internal travel is very limited. 
uh, and the rest. And it's uh, they have a very draconian approach, like in China. Uh, and in a sense, that works. I mean, there are costs, but, but that actually works. But there is a recognition now that uh, they're going to they're going to need vaccinations. They can't stay closed forever. So at some point, that process has to start. And certainly, there's a, 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 there's an interest in doing that. Uh, the problem is, uh, the devil is in the detail. Uh, there's some offers there. And certainly, from a, from a North Korean perspective, they are expecting at least the same kind of treatment that uh, uh, the, the Senegalese are getting. Uh, it was announced yesterday that Senegal is getting a, a, a vaccine production facility. Uh, I think North Korea would very much like their own vaccine production facility to actually produce uh, the vaccines to deal with its 20 million people. Well, you just uh, touch upon the um, sort of the internal situation in uh, in the DPRK, which was my next question. So, um, on one hand, you know, you mentioned the uh, economic cost. There are some reports about well, I don't want to say uh, starting famine, but definitely, you know, difficult situation um, when it comes to nutrition. On the other hand, you know, you mentioned the need for vaccines. We've also seen, uh, you know, recent reports about some grave uh, uh, incident, and we, we are not too sure whether this was related to uh, in case of COVID, of course, to some extent, uh, for the North Koreans to say that they actually do have some Cases of COVID could, could could be in a way a good argument for them to get more vaccines because you know some people could say well if there are no cases why we should send them any vaccines at all so you know why how how would you you know let's say in, in, if you were in their shoes what would you do and also uh, you know how do you see the internal situation uh, developing well, I mean uh, as I said the clo- closing the economy down has had enormous costs. Uh, all the evidence suggests that there is virtually nothing coming in. I mean, imports have fallen by 80, 90%. Uh, there is almost nothing going out. So, I mean, it, 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 and that clearly creating strains. Uh, I'm always a little bit wary about reports out of North Korea, but it seems to me that it's unlikely that there aren't problems with, I'm not talking about famine, but I am talking about shortages. Uh, it seems unlikely that in those circumstances there, there, there are not substantial problems uh, in, in, in terms of the economy in a variety of ways. There's no inputs coming in. So anything that requires an input from outside is not happening. Uh, so there, there are clearly difficulties there. I mean, Australia... Well, New Zealand is closed down. They're not pretending, uh, and, and are close to zero COVID, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but they're not pretending they don't need vaccines. So even if North Korea is right and there are no and there are no cases, then it still needs to, you know, uh, to vaccinate probably 15 million people. I everybody above the age of uh, uh, of 18 or even lower and they need two vaccines so that's 30 million vaccination 30 million doses they need uh, I mean I guess it's a matter of pride or whatever I don't really think it matters a lot whether there are a small number of cases or whether there are no cases I mean the reality is that they need vaccinations and the reality is that if the world's going to be safe for everybody we we're, we're, we're talking about vaccinating the world and there are no exceptions uh in in the north korean case it's got a particular salience because of some of the issues of, uh, around it but certainly uh, if you're talking about confidence building measures and you i trust building it seems to me that something around a, a generosity on the vaccine program and and production facilities could be could be a positive uh i think you you, you, you don't make it conditional but you make it generous right right yes you, you mentioned now the option of having a production facility you mentioned the example of senegal of course this may be a little bit difficult to even you know if if, if, if we had uh, i um sort of problems to envisage and build uh 
reactors it may be difficult to build um, vaccine production plants but on the other hand um, you know the so the other alternate alternative is usually to deliver the vaccines to the country but of course if North Korea is sort of closed uh, its borders so much that it's not allowing um, um, basically anyone in then um, you know how, how would you deal with this uh, situation well, I mean in, in the sense it, it has to be dealt with uh, which means that the North Koreans have to you, know, you can't you can't bring in vaccines without a small number uh, of people I think you need to keep it to the minimum uh, but yes I mean in equally uh, uh, sorry uh, I'm not a I'm not a biologist or a virologist but it seems to me that you can't you can't dump a million doses of vaccine on the border and leave them for a month to make sure the COVID goes away before you use them. I mean, these these have a, a use date. I think the I mean, North Korea has got a reasonably good uh, health infrastructure, uh, health architecture. Uh, from my experience, the problem is it's got no inputs. But the realities are that, that in Pyongyang, you could probably do things where you need ultra cheap vaccines, ultra cold. cold. Outside of Pyongyang, I'm, I would think that's going to be very difficult. Uh, and the reality is that I suspect, uh, I mean, one of the questions are going to, is going to be what the priority is for vaccine uh, delivery. Uh, I think it would be very difficult if, North Korea was to say they're prioritizing the army or even the the Korean Workers' Party. I think if they were going to start the process in Pyongyang, uh, that's probably acceptable, but it's not my decision. Right, right. Yes, I mean they're going to have to they're going to have to start letting some, a, a small number of people in. Uh, it, it, you, you've got to be careful, and, and obviously there are issues. I mean, again, I. I I'm not a biologist. I've, I've thought basic vaccine production, I'm not talking about development, production uh, is probably not at the cutting edge of technology. Uh, if you're starting to think about deploying it in, 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 in African countries, it seems to me this is not cutting edge technology and you don't need to sort of panic that this is going to be a major boost to North Korea's biological weapons industry. Right, right. Yes, and of course... Uh... There are international mechanisms uh, like COVAX, which is uh, which has been very much supported and uh, financed by the European Union. Nowadays, other donors are coming, including the United States. So, in a way, international um, um, support through these channels will also have some multilateral implications in yeah. general. Yeah, I mean, I don't. The, the, the reality is, I, uh, the practical reality in the world as it stands at the moment is that certainly Western vaccines are not going to go into North Korea without Washington signing off on it. Right. Uh, uh, that seems to me to be the, the, the real politique of uh, the issue. Uh, and as I said, if you're trying to build some kind of relationship, obviously, you know, One's not expecting Washington, or for that matter, Brussels, to be to be silly, but uh, uh, with reasonable safeguards in place, it seems to me that that's that's perfectly possible. And it's really a political rather than a, yeah, the, 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 a technical choice. Yeah. I mean, Thierry Breton, uh, the commissioner, was in Dakar yesterday announcing the uh, the, the, uh, the 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 Senegal plant. Uh, it, it seems to me it's it, it's not an impossible barrier to overcome with respect to uh, with respect to North Korea. Uh, I would maybe at this moment uh, like to open the discussion uh, to the audience. We have a very tiny audience here in the room, so of course you are also very much welcome to ask questions. Before we get uh, some questions from the audience, um, at one point you were also talking about. Um, um, sort of the multilateral, the need for the multilateral uh, arrangement, and uh, also the role of the European Union. Of course, you've been a, a member of the European Parliament for a very long time. Uh, so, what, what do you think? What should be, can be, uh, role of the EU? How how can the EU 
uh, contribute apart from just well, I mean, I, money? I think the EU can have a, a number of, uh, can contribute in a number of ways. I mean, last time round with the agreed framework uh, and around the issue of kind of things like six-party talks, the European Union did not participate in the process. Uh, but the European Union was then brought into, if you want, the delivery, i.e. with the agreed framework, we weren't part of the negotiations in any way whatsoever. Uh, but we then ended up as being signed up to the Korean Energy Development Organization, which was actually contributing the $4.5 billion to the construction of the two light water reactors. Uh, as a reaction to that, I was responsible in the parliament for uh, a resolution that said, next time round, no say, no pay. Uh, it, it seems to me the European Union has a choice. It can, it, it can step aside. We're, we're, we're as far away from the Korean Peninsula as almost anybody. Uh, it's it's perfectly possible for it to happen without us. But I think what would be silly for, uh, if you want, the, uh, the menu to be chosen by other people and then we get stuck with part of the bill. Mm -hmm. So we need to make a decision, are we engaging or aren't we? Uh, now, my preference will be for the European Union to engage, but fine. I, uh, I, I there has got a logic to it, but if you're going to, if you're going to do the paying, you, you, you need a bit of the saying as, uh, as well. Um, and it's certainly Angela Merkel. I mean, she won't be there when this happens. Now she 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 will have been replaced uh, in the uh, in, in the forthcoming G German uh, uh, elections. But she did indicate back when Trump was in negotiation uh, with the North Koreans that the European Union would make be willing to make a contribution. Uh, apart from a financial contribution, it's possible for a political contribution. I mean, at the moment, the North Koreans aren't talking to uh, uh, to the United States. We're not quite sure what's happening with South Korea, but even if they are talking to South Korea, uh, that's not enough. Uh, the North Koreans are interested in reopening the political dialogue with the European Union. The European Union has got to agree. Uh, it seems to me that uh, if Washington had a say in this, Washington would be saying to the European Union, please, that doesn't mean to say the dialogue's going to be easy. The dialogue may be quite rough. But at, at the moment, they're not talking to Washington and they're offering to talk to the European Union. I'd have thought uh, the sensible thing to do is to take up that offer. Right. right. Just to play the devil's advocate, uh, usually those who are opposed uh, to this, they say, well, but there would be a reward for bad behavior, right? If he uh, starts... Uh, well, I mean, the any peace settlement is a reward for bad behavior. Think of a peace settlement that wasn't a reward for bad behavior. I mean, in, it, it, the classic example is, for me, obviously, is, is someone who's British, is, is the settlement on, on, the Irish, uh, uh, on the island of Ireland. Uh, you actually had people who killed men, women, and children in the United Kingdom, IRA terrorists, with letters guaranteeing they would not be prosecuted. I mean, peace processes are nasty. There is going to be no peace. I mean, there's going to be no peace process on the Korean Peninsula, peace process, uh, that's actually going to have Kim Jong-un in jail. I mean, South Africa, Truth and Reconciliation Committee, whatever. Uh, this is the, the brutality of, of peace process. You have, to, you have to tolerate the intolerable and forgive the unforgivable. I mean, otherwise they don't happen. So anyone who thinks that you, you, this could all be neatly packaged and tied up with, with, with the ribbons of justice is, is wrong. That's not how you get peace. Yes. Right. I mean, the European Union uh, has its policy of critical engagement. I have uh, lots of colleagues who argue that uh, the policy totally failed and we should just come up with totally new one. Others would argue, well, it's a good policy, but it hasn't actually been filled uh, with what it says. So, you know, it's been much more critical than engaging, basically. Um, of course, within the EU, you have different views between member states, and then Brussels should be sort of the in, the, the the place where you find a, a joint position. So, you know, what would you what would you suggest to to 
both the national governments, like here in Berlin, but also to to people in Brussels, what they should do, you know, what what, what can be done from the European uh, side. Well, I mean, first we could actually implement our policy. I mean, we officially have a policy of critical engagement. It's a lie. I mean, we have critical non-engagement. I mean, the, the, the North Koreans that I mentioned uh, are willing to reopen the political dialogue that the European Union has frozen um, on human rights. Back in 2001, uh, w when the European Union troika of Goran Pearson, Javier Solano and Chris Patton actually travelled to Pyongyang, one of the agreements was to open diplomatic relations uh, between the European Union and, the, uh, 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 and, and North Korea and open a human rights dialogue and a political dialogue. Political dialogue is frozen. Uh, France and Belgium have blocked for the last 20 years actually establishing a North Korean embassy in Brussels. At the moment, well, until recently, the North Korean uh, representation to Brussels was based in London. Uh, that was changed with Brexit to Berlin. But it seems to me that if you're going to have relations at all, you actually want them, you want them next door. You want to be able to call in the North Korean ambassador and complain about what they're doing rather than, rather than post them a letter from, from Brussels to Berlin. So, and on human rights, uh, the North Koreans uh, closed the human rights dialogue in 2003. It had been going, been going for two years. I was told by commission officials we're just beginning to get a little bit of information. Uh, I don't want to exaggerate, but there, there, was, a, there, there was some minor progress. Uh, I was involved in putting pressure on the North Koreans through the dialogue that we've been involved in to actually reopen the human rights dialogue. And um, Back in 2014, uh, Kang suk Ju. Uh, came to Brussels, uh, we, we organized his visit, and they offered to reopen the human rights dialogue. Uh, the European Union refused. I'm constantly told about the problems of North Korean human rights, and they're there, they're serious. I'm making, you know, don't let anyone have any misapprehensions. There are very serious human rights problems in, in North Korea, but they've re offered to reopen the dialogue, and the European Union has refused. So... Uh, Yes, critical engagement would be nice if we could get it. Right. <laughs> you know, you just mentioned uh, the issue of human rights. I think in, during the Trump administration, um, well, for quite a long time, uh, there was no, you know, there was lots of discussion about denuclearization, but the human rights situation was sort of in, 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 at the back burner, so mm. to speak. Uh, now it seems to me that with Biden, he he is trying to put the issue of human rights uh, quite upfront. But of course, at the same time, that's one issue that the North Korean side is very sensitive about. So how do you do it so that you do talk about human rights, but at the same time, you sort of don't politicize it or don't use it as a, as a tool for other means? Well, I mean, firstly, one has to decide what one's priorities are. Uh, it seems to me that, that, that you can't do everything at the same time. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that other actors may not, if you want, press in other areas. But if you've decided the most crucial thing is to effectively end North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons and I, inter intercontinental ballistic missile program, then you, you can't afford to end up producing a Christmas tree of hanging everything on it whatsoever. You need to be focused. Now, you could take a different approach and say that the key issue is human rights, uh, and the North Koreans could keep their nuclear weapons, but you, you have to decide what your priorities are. So I, mean, I think that's one thing. Secondly, there are ways, in my view, of approaching the human rights issue in North Korea, but you, 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 you start where it's easier. I mean, the, the North Koreans have been part of the uh, Universal Periodic Review at the United Nations on the human rights issues. Uh, it's fundamentally been around issues around things like disability rights and women's rights. Uh, and I, I don't get the numbers exactly perfect, but the recommendations last time around were there are 117 recommendations and the North Koreans accepted 85 in whole and, and 12 in part. 
Now, mm. it, so it, it is it, it, so use use where you can get. I mean, the Handicap International uh, oh, ten years ago or, or more lobbied the Supreme People's Assembly on disability rights, and they're actually successful in getting the Supreme People's Assembly to pass a law on disability rights in North Korea. Mm. I'm sure it's not implemented very effectively. Uh, we have the same problem in Europe, where some of our disability legislation is not perfectly implemented. But there's some. Uh, if you, you, there are things that can be. You can either con confront or go around the back, uh, and it's it's very difficult. But yes. Human rights is a problem all over the world. There's certainly a problem in North Korea. Do we take the view that we just want to castigate them? I mean, that's part of the problem with the European Union, refusing to agree to reopen the human rights dialogue. Certainly some people tell me, because that would make them look too good. Well, do you, do you want to actually do something about human rights, or do you want to, uh, do you want to use North Korea as the poster boy for uh, the, the evil empire? All right, all right. I would uh, at the moment ask again uh, um, uh, any questions from the from the audience, either here or uh, online. So if if there is any question here, uh, yes. So I will I will shortly repeat the question. So um, uh, Glenn has emphasized uh, that to reach a, a nuclear deal, there, there is a need for U.S. DPRK agreement. Uh, but of course, to um, I mean, South Korean side is of course another player. So, what could the ideal South Korean government do to 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 help uh, to do this, despite all the political divisions inside of uh, South Korea? I mean, I can certainly suggest things that the South Koreans can do. I mean, but one's got to be uh, 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 practical about what's politically possible. The North would very much like the South Koreans to break away from the maximum pressure regime uh, and, and, and the rest. Uh, how practically possible that is at any time, even with a progressive president, is is difficult to judge. Uh, and certainly with a looming election, I mean, the, the North Koreans, you know, they have their version of reference news. They have summary of world news. They they know the results of the French local elections. They might not necessarily understand what they are. So they're certainly watching with great attention uh, what's happening in South Korea and looking at the, the prospects for whether it's going to be a, a progressive president or a conservative president to succeed uh, uh, Moon Jae-in. Uh, but yes, I mean... You still have a problem with trust building, and this is why this I made the argument about the need for a bipartisan policy, because I mean, Kaesong, uh, in the Kaesong Industrial Complex was uh, was successful at one level. Um, back, uh, I mean, the idea. I guess many of your listeners will know, but I mean, the plan was to do it in three phases. You're firstly, you were going to have, in the case of the industrial complex, you're going to have 50,000 North Koreans actually actually working in the complex. Uh, and then it was going to be 250,000 in phase two. And then it was going to 450,000 in phase three. Now, only one person from each household was allowed to work in, was going to be allowed to work in case on. So in practical terms, but when you got to phase three, you were going to have close to 2 million people dependent on case on. <laughs> that was close to 10% of the North Korean population. Now, the North Koreans at one point closed down Kaesong, uh, back about 2014, I think. Uh, uh, and the reason for that was internal faction fight uh, between the United Front Department and, and the party. Uh, because the the scenario that was being played with was that what was going to happen, you're going to get to 10% of the population economically dependent on Kaesong, and then the South Korean government was going to close it, and then three months later there'd be food riots, and that would be the excuse to come in and intervene. And that was the, how, how realistic that scenario was, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, the outcome of that standoff between the Two faction, the two groups inside North Korea was what I call a nil-nil draw. 
Uh, it was a nil nil draw in that they reopened case on, but decided it was not going to expand effectively beyond 50,000. Uh, then, of course, the, the, the skeptics were proved right because then President Park and Hay actually closed case on. And so all of those that were saying, we've got to be very careful about these programs because it can be an opportunity for future governments to actually, if you want, undermine us, mm -hmm. we say, look, see, we were right. Imagine if it had been up to 250 or 450,000 and then President Park and Hay or a future president suddenly decides closing it, mm -hmm. that's it, finished. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that the security negotiations will be with the United States. As I've said earlier, the economic contribution will be largely coming from South Korea. Uh, but at the moment, it's very difficult to imagine you can have the, the, the second without before the first has been signed off. If you look at different uh, opinion polls in South Korea, it looks like that um, it is mainly the older generation which is uh, still interested in, you know, relationship with North Korea, unification and so on. When you look uh, at different uh, polls among the young people, put uh, it very crudely, they don't seem to care much. Oh, so, yes, they do care, and they care the, the other way. I mean, I'm not sure they, right. I, I'm not sure they mm -hmm. kind of know they care. Mm -hmm. But I mean, oh, two years ago, I was at a, at a seminar, uh, maybe a little bit more, when someone was urging early unification, mm -hmm. uh, the opportunities of early unification. And I made the point about who's kept paying the cost. And someone said, well, I mean, it's no problem. It would just mean our standard of living in South Korea would fall by 20%. Uh, and I, my response was, well, in Greece, the standard of living fell by 18%, and there were riots on the streets. No. Uh, <laughs> yes, they do care. I mean, which is game why, in a sense, in the South, they need to be, uh, uh, need to be acknowledging what the North saying, that early swift unification is assimilation or collapse, and both of those would be bad news. I mean, uh, there are... I'm told there are 10 million North Koreans within seven days' walk of Seoul. And mm -hmm. uh, now, if North Korea collapses, and there are people, uh, at least individuals in the US, who are in favor of a, a, a promoting regime collapse, well, the, the consequences are enormous. Uh, and as I said, the North Koreans say that early unification is assimilation. You're never going to get the, the leadership in North Korea to agree to that. So why don't we all agree that the way forward is, if you want, a slow process? All right. Yeah, in a sense, since we are here in Germany, uh, sort of what, what has what, what took place in the past, uh, in the 1970s, 80s, mm. with uh, uh, Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt's South politic, uh, sort of coexistence of the two, mm with the fact that North Korea would need more uh, economic development uh, to, to, to reach certain standards. I will now move to sort of more international uh, context and, yeah. and the changes uh, around the globe at the moment. And that seems to me that the, one of the key, key changes is um, sort of uh, increasing uh, competition between the United States and China. And how does North Korea fit into it? Can we somehow uh, make sure that North Korea doesn't become sort of a theater of this competition? Or do we sort of automatically I mean, expect that it's part of the Chinese uh, I mean, you can't. Influence? It's impossible to separate North Korea from, the, if you want, the Washington-Beijing issue entirely. Uh, it, it, it rather depends. I mean, the European Union had, has, for the moment, an approach that we're simultaneously competitors, cooperators, and uh, and, uh, and 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 rivals. Yeah. Uh, if if you tr if the U.S. tries to keep that balance, there clearly will be areas where the two can work. To, the two need to work together. You can't you can't say you're simultaneously it's sort of cooperating and competing in in different sectors mm -hmm. without having some of the cooperation. And obviously, uh, there's a recognition that, that, that climate change is probably uh, at the top of the agenda. But after that, the Korean Peninsula is second. 
one has to be careful. There's sometimes a view to assume that North Korea is a wholly owned subsidiary of China. They are not. I mean, certainly in the period up to, in the run up to 2017, I mean, the, the North Koreans were very hostile to China. And there was interest in Pyongyang in almost doing a pivot, uh, doing a, a Nixon in reverse, and, uh, and with Pyongyang pivoting towards Washington. But it was clear that, that Washington either rejected it or didn't even understand it was on offer. That was signaled when, when uh, Kim Jong-un actually had his first summit with Xi. That was the message. Now, I've, I'm not naive. The idea was, I mean, North Korea was very successful in the seesaw relationship between Moscow and Beijing. Uh, so it, it, it alternated its, uh, it, it lent in one direction and then the other and benefited from the, those switches of direction. Uh, North Korea was interested, in my view, in setting up a similar kind of relationship between Beijing and Washington, but it, it would have to pivot to Washington to start with. And, and China was very nervous about that. But, uh, and then you got the, the, the Xi Kim Jong-un summit, and, and that meant that that, that was over. But we should not assume that uh, you know, the North Koreans are, you know, are, are, are entirely run by the Chinese, and they're, they're very nervous about it. Uh, when we talked about vaccines, the one thing we didn't talk about was well, I didn't talk about was whether uh, why, why aren't they depending on Sinovac? Well, they do not want to be dependent on China, and economically, they are. Uh, they can't really avoid that, at least for the moment, but don't let's go too far. Speaking of vaccine, there has been some reports that actually it's Russia supplying uh, its uh, Sputnik V vaccine. Mm -hmm. So I guess Russia is the other actor that's uh, quite often mentioned in relationship mm -hmm. to uh, to China, although um, it seems that Russia is not as strong uh, as a strong actor as, as China is. But at one point you also mentioned... Um, The, um, the 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 G7 statement uh, and and sort of um, U.S. Japan links um, or or the fact that the U.S. is uh, sort of uh, adopting the the, the Japanese uh, uh, point of view. Do you think that this is maybe due to the fact that the the American uh, priority at the moment is China and therefore? Um, you know, to sort of uh, forge the alliance with Japan or strengthen they, they would sort of do yeah, something yeah. Japan I mean, it, it, wants and therefore what perhaps South Korea would like uh, is, uh, is more in the in the background. I mean, there's a, there is a danger that North Korea becomes used as a, a proxy for other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've said on several occasions, you, you've got to decide what your priorities are. And if your priorities are to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula, that, 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 has, that has certain consequences for other policies. Uh, but if you're going to use North Korea to bash China with, uh, and, and if you're going to bring Japan into the, into the mix in a, in a serious way, Uh, as I said earlier, and I'll repeat it, I mean, uh, what North Korea did in terms of abducting Japanese uh, Japanese individuals was un uh, was unforgivable. Uh, nevertheless, there is a great deal of nervousness uh, in Pyongyang about the fact that uh, the other thing Biden has, uh, uh, has done is to bring Japan into the equation. And, I mean, the North Koreans are as attentive as, as I am, probably more attentive. They won't, they won't have missed the fact that when, that when uh, Tony Blinken was in Tokyo, uh, he, was, he, he was wearing one of the abductee badges on his lapel. Now, their view, rightly or wrongly, is that Japan's refusal to agree anything at the six-party talks until the abductee issue was resolved actually was responsible for effectively uh, uh, wrecking those talks. So we have now a question uh, going back more to South Korea. Uh, I'll just read the question. To what extent do you think South Korea's soft power can be influential for the international perception of the Korean Peninsula problem? And how effective, uh, soft, uh, how effective South Korea's soft power can be for the peace process? 
how did I put this? I mean, South Korea, for, for Europeans, and I'm talking not about someone like myself, who obviously has been involved in East Asia now for more than a quarter of a century. I, uh, but, I mean, I think South Korea has appeared. I mean, South, South Korea is now a player in Europe. I mean, in terms of soft power, I mean... Uh, people's children are now in love with K-pop. I mean, so in that sense, I mean, what South Korea says and does has a, has a, has a global impact that it, that, that it didn't. I mean, a, a few years ago, not so many years ago, uh, I, was in, uh, I was in Myanmar, in Burma. I was on a small island off the coast of, uh, of southern Burma. Uh, this, was a, uh, this was a holiday after uh, I had a 16-year visa ban from Burma. And when they lifted my visa ban, when Aung San Suu Kyi came in, came in uh, I, I went there for a holiday. But I was on this small remote island, invited to a wedding, and they were playing size <laughs> Gangnam style. <laughs> So if you ask me what kind of music was I going to hear on a remote uh, 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 Myanmar island, uh, it, it, it wouldn't have been that. So, I mean, in that sense, I think, yes, yeah, South Korea has become a, a soft, soft power player in the world. And, I mean, there's an increasing recognition that South Korea is a, 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 a significant player, even in terms of hard power. I mean, I I saw recently, you know, it's the, the 10th, Tenth most powerful economy in the world. I mean, and the invitation. I mean, there are good reasons for it, but the invitation to join the D10. I mean, it's partly about South Korea being in an important hard and soft power, and it's also partly about an attempt to contain China. But I mean, that's a separate issue. I'm I'm slightly amused. I mean, uh, somebody was saying, "Well, we've got to involve Australia because they're close to China." The European Union is actually closer to China than Australia is. Um, I remember years ago as a South Korean delegation uh, in the European Parliament and one of my colleagues who shall remain nameless was saying to the South Korean delegation, you must be worried about what's happening in East Timor uh, and, and raised it several times. And at, over lunch, one of the South Koreans said to me, East Timor is seven and a half hours flying time away. It's about, it's about as close to us as Chicago is to Brussels. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes you have to get your geography straight, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've made the same stupid mistake. I mean, first time I went to New Zealand, I flew to I flew to Sydney, uh, and then assumed it was a sort of short trip to New Zealand. And when I got on the plane, and they started telling us what films they were showing, I thought maybe it's further than I thought, or it's going to be a cartoon. <laughs> yes. Um... We, we were just talking about soft power. Uh, related to that is the issue of, let's say, people-to-people -people exchanges, which is one area where uh, here the Institute for Korean Studies has been quite involved. Uh, but it's not always seen very positively. Sometimes, uh, um, you know, attempts to, um, to do some uh, contacts with the North Korean side uh, on the economic level or other levels, uh, cultural level, are seen that uh, you are sort of, uh, well, first of all, sort of financing uh, uh, the trips, uh, which can be difficult, but also, you know, a bit politically controversial that uh, the visitors are not always those who should be coming. This is also sometimes a problem of um, governments that they don't issue visas afterwards, even if you want to do some exchanges and and then in the end, it, it fails because of that. So what's your view on, you know, how academics, how possibly NGOs should um, should be in, 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 in the I mean, interaction in, of the in, North Korean? I'm very much in favor uh, and, uh, of, if you want, uh, not regime change in North Korea, but changing regime. Uh, uh, and if you're going to change North Korea, that means you need as many contacts as possible. Now, I understand, I mean, the again, it's it's not easy. The practical realities are the first yeah, 10,000 people that are going to come out of North Korea well, as academics, as visitors, as cultural program, whatever, are going to be people that are close to the regime. I mean, if we want to show them what the rest of the world is like and what the possibilities are, we need to get more people out, not less. 
so you, know, you, 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 have to, you have to buy that. Um, you're not going to get the North Korean dissidents being the ones that were sent out. So, but yes, we want to change the... the, the uh, as I said, I'm in favour of changing regime, not regime change. You want to encourage people to open up, encourage things to be uh, to be different there. Um, so I always take the view that every time the North Koreans do something terrible, uh, then we should ease sanctions. Uh, so you actually say to them, uh, uh, if you're really if you're really badly behaved, we're going to make it absolutely free for any North Korean to come to anywhere uh, with no restrictions whatsoever. It's a slight joke, but just in case anyone. Uh, and I, I assume that this would apply uh, in the other direction. So obviously now the borders are closed, but at some point once they are open, there may be chance for yeah, the if you move about things like tourism. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it supports the regime. Well, I mean, of course it does. I mean, any money going in, but there were tens of thousands of Chinese going in. Uh, I don't think the regime it was fundamentally supported by the fact there were a few there were a few hundred Europeans going in. Right. <laughs> um, and yes, I mean that's also a way of seeing the difference. Um, Yeah, I, I think the American ban on people going to North Korea is, is a mistake. I, uh, I the, the visa waiver program for the United States does not apply to me. I've been to North Korea. If you've been to North Korea, uh, I, I have to get a, I have to apply for a U.S. visa. Uh, th that means that less people go to North Korea than mine. The more people that go to North Korea, in my view, you know, just to sh show people a difference, the better. So I would I would urge Biden to lift the, the, the travel ban. Well, it's not, not ban, but yeah, it, it, I know of people who have been wait, who have waited six months to try and get a U.S. visa uh, because they've been to North Korea. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we should sort of make it easier for interaction both in, in both ways. I mean, it's, I mean, we have a situation now where it's effectively. Uh, it's it's kind of productive. It's almost impossible for North Koreans to travel to the United States, so it actually makes it very difficult. And certainly, some of the some of the early negotiations or pre negotiations, I understand, uh, uh, in the run up to the, the the Trump summit in Singapore, had to be conducted elsewhere in Europe because it was in, it was all but impossible to to, to get North Koreans you wanted to talk to wanted to talk to you into the United States and it, and it seems to me that that is counterproductive right right yes uh, of course that was a good uh, good for the Europeans that they could host uh, the meetings but uh, yes well, yeah but I mean I'm I'm very pleased for the Europeans to host meetings but we should be hosting meetings as they actually want our expertise and our knowledge and not because they just want our venue right Yeah, indeed, uh, which, which is a very, a very nice um, point uh, towards the end. Um, so when, when do you think will be your next uh, almost, almost 50th uh, trip to, to the... Well, project? I mean, as I, as I said, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Pyongyang has indicated they would like uh, us to take a delegation back there uh, as soon as practical. Uh, the reality is partly because of China as much as North Korea, because at the moment I understand that if you go to China, you've got to spend 28 days in quarantine. Now, I mean, forget about anybody else who's coming with me. I'm not prepared to go to North Korea if I've got to spend a month in quarantine on the way in or a month in quarantine on the way out. Uh, I, I'm going to be taking three months out of my life. Uh, I'm not going to get anybody to come with me on that basis. So until... That's eased. I mean, it, it's not going to be practical. And I understand from people who know these things that it's unlikely that China is going to open up uh, much before the end of this year. And that's just the first part of the trick, is you've then got to go into North Korea. So I, I, I hope to be proved wrong. So I think it will be good to actually have a meeting. I suspect... I will not be packing my bags for Pyongyang much before March next year. But so please prove me wrong. So, in, to some extent, it may all depend on uh, availability of vaccines. Uh, so, going back to our um, earlier point, which also brings me to 
uh, sort of uh, invitation to the next edition of uh, this forum, which we will have in about two weeks' time. We will um, let you all know when this is going to take place, but the topic should be about COVID-19 and vaccinations on the Korean Peninsula and East Asia. Uh, but before 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 I, we conclude, uh, is there any final word, final thought? Uh, uh, I mean, I, like to uh, it's always the, the threat and opportunity. I mean, COVID's an enormous threat to the world, but it does provide opportunities. And I think we should look at how we can take them. Uh, I also take the point that uh, however much people dislike the North Korean regime, uh, clearly some people dislike it intensely, uh, th there are 20 million people in North Korea who who, who need our protection. Uh, yeah, Hungry children know no politics. I think uh, if you want, uh, North Koreans deserve, deserve better. All right. So that was that was very nice uh, final thought. I would also like to show everyone uh, the front page of the book uh, that uh, Glyn has published in 2018. I very much recommend uh, everyone reading it. So you can you can have a look. Uh, which one? And it's also it? available in Korean. Indeed, our viewers on 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 both sides of this virtual. Uh, virtual rendezvous, so to speak, can read that. I've done very little traveling out of Brussels in the last 12 months, so I'm <laughs> delighted to have this opportunity. Yes, well, thank you. So we will definitely uh, keep it in mind and invite you for another uh, conference at some, at some point. So thank you so much. Thank you also uh, to everyone who was uh, watching us. Um, and, uh, you know, for our sort of uh, first attempt at a kind of hybrid mixed event, maybe this is the future, uh, post-COVID uh, future of events. And uh, thank you very much again and uh, see you. See you next time.